welcome to this 100th episode of the I Hate Matt Ball Pooch Podcast. Today, it's the 100th episode. So this is going to be the Q&A episode. I have no idea how long this is going to go. That's what she said. And we are going to find out. Little housekeeping, Pharma Phoenix Rises, um, my out of print chapbook is now available as an ebook on Amazon. So you can pick that up. Poems Over Kitty is up on my Etsy shop for a limited time. Okay. Other uh, videos that I've been putting up over the last few days are the worst saying ever. Writers stop saying this now. Oh, how to be a writer when you're in toxic relationships or um, when you don't have supportive people around you. Or if you are living with, married to, dating a narcissist, things of that nature. And um, comparison being the enemy of joy. And how to deal with that. So, tons of cool stuff. So, go over to YouTube and check those things out. Uh, Another thing for members, I've been posting snippets from the documentary. I don't know if we've talked about the documentary. I think we have. I think we have. But I've been posting snippets of the documentary for members on my channel. Um, I've been uh, doing the Bukowski Book Club. We're still in um, dangling in the Turnforsha. And um, there is going to be... I'm going to be doing like audiobook versions of my chat books on the member stream. So um, there is that. And also, and then like the weekly Anarchy Crew workshops. Um, so those are always fun to do. So on with the schlow. All right. So here we are. Um, it's episode 100. I have a couple audio clips of a couple audio questions for you guys. Um, I have a bunch of um, questions in emails and in comments and stuff on the podcast. So we will be hitting as many of these as humanly possible. Uh, Other interviews I've been doing lately, um, I had a really great talk with Ethan McGuire, who you'll be hearing a question from in a little bit. Um, I had a great conversation with him. I had an amazing conversation with Bucks, but we didn't record it. And um, I'm kicking myself for that one because that dude was just spouting gold to me that whole time. So, Bucks, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for that conversation. It meant, like, um, it, it was great. Thank you so much for that. So here we go. Let's hit this first question here. This is from um, Chasey Delaney. I don't know if you guys are actually going to be able to hear this. I might need to put it in after the fact. So let me listen to it real quick. Well, actually, let me just do this and see if I can hear it. Hi, Matt. My question is, if you're not writing poetry with intent, how do you inject meaning or into the poem? Or how do you measure the meaning that is in the poem if you are writing with intent. Also, I don't know how to write with intent. How would you write with intent in poetry? Question was, it was in three parts. Basically, how do you write with intent to produce a poem that has meaning? Um, Two, even if you're not writing with intent, like spontaneously or something, how do you find meaning in the poem that you wrote? And three, what to do to write a poem with meaning? Um, So basically, I feel like when you are writing something spontaneously and you're doing more of a stream of conscious thing, as you're writing, when you start, you might not have any fucking clue what the fuck it is you're writing about. But as you are working through those lines, it's almost like your brain is trying to comprehend the things that you're going through and trying to make sense out of it. So usually, by the time you get to the end of that, there might be, very well might be, some kind of meaning in there, at least for you. 
Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean when people read it, they're going to see what that meaning is, meaning is and get that meaning. And um, we're going to be talking a little bit about confessional poets um, in a few weeks here. But like with their stuff, like their stuff for the most part, not always, but for the most part, their meaning was for them and not for anyone else kind of thing. And that's fine. If your poems are just telling a fun little story like with like a little punchline the punchline is the meaning okay and a lot of times when you do stuff like that that punchline very well could give a deeper meaning to something else like a social issue or just something that is happening in society at the time or even in entertainment at the time it's like a, it could turn into like a satirical stab. Now, I know a lot of the things I'm saying right now are kind of vague, but what I'm trying to tell you is you don't need to have meanings in your poems. When intent shows up, typically what that is like is you will find something. And so this is probably the third part of your question here, Chasey. You will be thinking about something and have like a strong urge to either share your thoughts on that or share a slant or a stance on something. And then you end up writing a poem around that. So if that's the case, then your intent is clear. And instead of thinking about how to write something with meaning at that point, you need to be thinking of how to convey that meaning the simplest way possible so that people will understand and at least think after a poem. Every poem that you write, by the end of the poem, it should make the reader go like this, like, oh, fuck. And it should make them kind of take a step back and think for a moment, okay? Even if your poem is just a story, like just like a little snapshot of something that happened to you there should be some kind of moment where the person has to reflect now some of you might be saying i don't think my poems do that and guess what that's fine they don't all have to do that i'm just telling you like what i look for in poetry like i want to be able to like take a step back and contemplate what i just fucking read you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, um, nothing has to be anything. Anything can be whatever the fuck we want it to be. And um, I know that a lot of people are going to get mad at that answer. But it's the truth, dude. Like, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Art is in the vein of the artist. Like, whatever you want to create, just fucking create. If that is your intent, creation, then everything you do has intent, okay? So there's that. So thank you for sending that in. I appreciate it. Okay, so let's. this one's from Ethan. Hey, Matt. It's Ethan McGuire here, hailing right now from Pensacola, where it is currently obscenely humid and incredibly hot. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about... Um, that I find really interesting right now is about Hollywood in LA and the way things may or may not be changing. So right now, it's really interesting to me that Hollywood seems to be losing its grip on popular culture, uh, American and worldwide. It reminds me of that great public enemy song, Burn Hollywood Burn. I love that song. Hollywood movies don't have the influence on the pop culture that they once did. And a lot of filmmaking has become, for the better, more decentralized, and for the worse, more platform-specific content-driven, especially with the onslaught of streaming services. The TV sh shows, too, um, they seem to be more spearheaded by these usually Silicon Valley-based streaming services rather than Hollywood companies. And other countries have filmmaking scenes that are are really taken off too. I mean, they have been for many years and years, of course, but um, in comparison to Hollywood as of right now, from what I can tell, uh, like China and India, who are honestly probably set to eventually overtake Hollywood in worldwide influence. 
um, especially after COVID. Um, and the most interesting movies made the last few years for my money are from uh, France and Mexico rather than America. Also, when I talk to Gen Zers, I find that TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram are way more important to them than Hollywood movies and TV shows. So, effectively, it seems like Silicon Valley, China, India have put Hollywood on some sort of death peg or at least knock them down many a peg. Then I also think about how LA and Hollywood is less important to current music than it used to be. Pop country out of Nashville is of course huge, and the best roots country is coming some out of Appalachia and Canada, more so out of Texas and Oklahoma, and even bigger, something that I also keep a close eye on, um, is hip hop, where the current biggest influence is honestly Atlanta, Georgia, and then places like Toronto and New York. So here's my question. As an LA guy yourself, do you notice any kind of change in the city as Hollywood loses a bit of its grip on the world? And more importantly, do you notice any change in the way non-filmmaking art like poetry, prose, painting, music, stuff like that is being made and expressed in LA? Thanks, Matt, and keep up the awesome work. Dude, that question is so fucking epic. Um, that could probably be its whole own episode, but let me let me try to play with this a little bit. Um, okay, so many so many things to hit there. Um, well, first off, as far as music goes, let's let's hit that first. Um, I think music died in L.A. around the late 80s I think prior it, it's really weird because like what you have is there have always been pockets of where music like thrived okay and if you want to talk like blues you had like the Delta Blues boom and then you had the Chicago Blues boom and then you went over to Detroit and had like the big Motown thing blow up and shit like that. And yes, a lot of the actual record labels are in LA. Um, but even with like your mainstream rock, like, oh, how do I say this right? Um, so in the 60s, you had a pretty big LA boom with music. You had like the doors, you had um, the birds, you had uh, fucking like Graham Parsons and shit. Like there were a lot of bands coming out of here. And when bands wanted to make it, they came here because that's where the A&R reps were. And the A&R reps are the ones who would sign the bands to the big deals. So bands would come from all over the place to come here, even if it wasn't to move, but just to play here in hopes that A&R reps would find them. And, I mean, you even had, like, um, during that same time, like in San Francisco, you had, like, um, Credence and you had fucking uh, Jefferson Airplane and shit like that. And um, sometimes a and reps would hear of stuff that far away. Um, and other times they would come down here and play in the whole fucking deal. The other thing that happened in the 60s, obviously, was the British invasion. Um, and that kind of changed a lot of things. You had two things happening all at once by the 80s, by the time the late 70s, early 80s rolled around here in L.A., which was you had the L.A. punk scene which kind of turned into new wave and that was happening kind of at the same time in new york so here you had bands like like x and um alice bag and uh just like a bunch of bands that weren't the hardcore punk bands which we'll talk about in a second and then um over in New York, you had like the Ramones, Blondie, Television, Talking Heads, and all that shit. So you had these two like amazing things that would eventually turn into, it was like the Go-Go's or LA based and all that shit. So you had all that stuff. 
But then when you have the hardcore punk come out of it, so like Black Flag, Circle Jerks, the whole deal, that went a whole different route. And I think one of the things that kind of hurt that scene was a lot of those venues were either being shut down or the shows were being shut down. So then what ended up coming out of everything in L.A. was the the metal bands, the like heavy metal slash glam rock bands. That was basically the death of music in L.A. And if you... Um, there's three amazing documentaries by Penelope Spears. Decline of Western Civilization 1, 2, and 3. And Decline 1... I highly recommend everyone watch these, okay? I think they're on YouTube, so you could check them out there. Decline 1 has, like, Black Flag, X, Fear, Circle Jerks, The Germs, um, Catholic Discipline, Alice Bag. Uh, I might be forgetting a band in there. And that pretty much documents the end of just the normal punk scene and the birth of the hardcore scene. Decline 2 focuses on the Sunset Strip scene, which was like, I mean, I can't remember what bands are in it exactly, but there's a lot of smaller bands in it. But like bands like Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, Poison, uh, Britney Fox, uh, and then like later on, like Pretty Boy Floyd and shit like that. Decline 3 um, was basically my teen years. Um, but that was like the punk scene in and around LA so like you had like Litmus Green and Citizen Fish and shit like that in the, but like total like gutter punk homeless punk kids kind of deal those are if you want to see like basically 20 years of documented shit in LA in the LA music scene like you can see that but decline two that's like really the only movie that where the word decline makes sense because that whole scene fucking killed la and it killed the sunset strip and what happened as a revolt against that was the seattle scene and when the seattle scene exploded that I think, and I'm not 100% on this, but that's when I'm pretty sure most record labels were like, okay, our A&R reps, instead of just going to clubs in LA to find bands, they need to go everywhere. We need to send them out in every fucking location to try to find bands and what's really hot. And because of, like you were saying, like the rise of social media and things of that nature, A&R reps don't really have a whole lot to do anymore. They just have to see what's trending. And if an unsigned band is trending and they have a huge fucking following, like no shit they're going to sign them. It's like no, no duh. But at the same time, I think bands are capable now, just like any other art form, of making enough money doing it on their own that they really don't need the backing of a label like all of these things like record labels um movie studios and we'll talk about that other shit in a second here all of those things need to figure out a way and even like book publishers they need to figure out a way to make offers that are so fucking enticing that people will give up their fucking like rights to everything to be in with them because the other thing is the only reason why record labels um traditional publishing um even fucking movie studios are even a fucking big deal anymore is because of our nostalgia and the second we die off and our kids are running the show nobody's gonna give a shit about where your book came from. No one's going to give a shit what movie studio put out your film. No one's going to give a shit what record label put out your shit. Because I don't know about you, but when I was younger, like I would go, oh, that's on Revelation Records? I'm going to get it. Oh, that's on Asian Man Records? I'm going to get it. That's on SST? I'm going to get it. 
that's on nitro i'm gonna get it like we became fan oh sub pop are you fucking with me i'll get that we became fans of the curation of these record labels you know like there was a time when like i was just talking to um bucks about this too we were talking about faber and faber they put out beautiful books they put out books that we're gonna buy because that's who put them out but as the world turns and as fucking our generation keeps getting older the younger generation is going to stop giving a fuck about any of that and they're just gonna fucking follow the people they want to follow all of that shit is like slowly dying and unless they could come up with some fucking beautiful way to make people rich beyond their wildest fucking dreams they're gonna die and if you've noticed how a lot of these companies have been doing their business lately, their business is, how can I fuck them out of as much money as possible so that our CEOs can make as much money as possible? That's going to kill that industry. The only reason why anyone would want to be a part of a company like that is to make more money than humanly possible on their own. And all the last fucking five to six years have shown us is that people can make a ridiculous amount of money without any fucking help. Okay? So, that's just that. But, like, like you saying, like, Atlanta's, like, the big hip-hop thing. Like, I thought... I could have sworn Atlanta has been, like, the kind of hub for hip-hop for decades. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that. As far as, like, um, China, like, overtaking Hollywood, again... The only thing Hollywood has going for it is what's out my window right now. And if you don't know what's out my window right now, it's the fucking Hollywood sign. Nostalgia is such a huge fucking motivator. So if Hollywood is smart, they're going to keep cashing in on the fact that Hollywood is really fucking cool. And remember all the good old days in Hollywood? That's the only thing that's going to keep it going. If they fucking slide on making Hollywood cool, if you stop seeing those Hollywood postcards when you visit L.A., like, L.A. is going to go to shit. Like, no one's going to give a fuck. We are moving faster and faster to a world of complete AI like ready ready player one is like and I'm not trying to be like conspiracy theory guy here but we can do so much on our own on our computer in our little caves that all of that shit outside is becoming like less and less and less important and there needs to be people in these big companies who know this and who are scared of this and who are working around the clock trying to figure out how to change that. Because if they don't, they're fucked. Um, the deal with China and India, because um, I already think Bollywood is bigger than Hollywood as far as like, I mean, I, that might not be true. I don't know. Um, it's, it's pretty close. But um, as far as China goes, I don't know if the Chinese government could allow for freedom of artistic expression the same way that we do here. And until that changes, I don't think China can overtake. I think China could overconsume American product, but I don't think that they could actually create more than we do here just based off of their own government regulations. So that's that. But, dude, that was, like, a deep question. I hope I answered all of it. If I didn't, let me know, and I'll um, come back and do another bit for it. Because that was fucking awesome. All right. Good question, dude. Okay. So, here is a question from Valerie. And we talked in email about this, but this is a question that I think some of you might be interested in. So, it says, Hi, Matt. I recently turned onto your podcast after hearing you on Heavy Board. 
You inspired me to start selling my chapbooks on Etsy. Thank you so much. I just have one question about shipping. What have you found is the best way to ship chapbooks? Do you use cardboard mailers or just a regular envelope? If you have a specific envelope that you use, I'd love to hear it. I don't have any right here. Um, but I basically just use um, a six by nine mailer, like a manila six by nine envelope. I get them on Amazon. They are the Amazon basics version. And I have it set up on um, that shit where it just delivers to you every month kind of thing. Um, I can't remember what that's called. Subscribe and save or some shit like that. I have some of my materials through Amazon like that. So um, that is just handy. Um, and I've never really had anyone complain about the chapbooks that they got. Um, I did have one person tell me, and this is weird, it's the same person and it's in the same like obviously same area so i think it's their post office or something but um two times they've said that um the chapbooks they got were water damaged so i have no idea how the fuck that happened but um maybe getting um something with like or may i should just probably start putting some of my chapbooks in plastic when i send them if you do anything bigger than that it's considered um, not a large envelope, and so you'll be, I think, charged for a package at that point. Um, if you use a bubble mailer, you will be charged for a package, and that's when um, shit starts getting really pricey. The only places that it's really expensive for me to ship my chapbooks to are Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Pretty much everywhere else, um, the shipping itself is usually around three bucks, and um, then just like the envelopes, like another, like I don't know, fifty cents. Um, I don't know exactly what the breakdown is on that. It's probably like twenty-five cents or fifty cents, but that's pretty much uh, the cost of it if you do it like that. Now I have heard that if you use something like um, stamps.com or even um, do the shipping through Etsy or um, this thing called Pirate Ship, I'm gonna be looking into pretty soon here, um, that your shipping rates, or even USPS has its own little thing for that now, but um, the shipping rates are a lot cheaper. I don't know how much cheaper, because um, I again, I haven't looked into it. That's on my giant to-do list of things to do. That is something, so um, hopefully that was helpful for Valerie, and I've seen Valerie's chapbooks, Valerie Loot. So um, let me know when those chapbooks are out so um, I can tell everyone to go get them. Let's see here. Okay, so here is a question from Grayson. It says, so I'm wrestling with getting my short stories out in front of readers. Would you recommend Kindle Vela? I have heard mixed reviews there. Here's the thing with Kindle Vela. I do not think the platform is good the way they have it. If you write romance, there is a market for that. If you don't write romance, I would not fuck around with Kindle Vela. As much as I have been looking for a place to put out serialized content, um, Kindle Vela just kind of sucks. So, with that said, um, yeah, I, I would stay away from that. I think um, doing something like Substack or Patreon um, is pr probably more Substack than Patreon, but I think that's probably a better bet in doing any kind of serialized storytelling, unless you have a blog that you could put that stuff up on and hope that there are other things that you can do to pull money in. But if you're doing um, like short stories and stuff, and the short stories aren't connected, especially in a cliffhangery kind of way, um, any kind of subscription model is going to be a little difficult. Um, but I would definitely not recommend Kindle Vela if that's the road you're going down. 
So I hope that was helpful. Um, I did get a question about what software I use when I format my chat books. So um, I do this, and this is from Welcome to the Void. Um, I do everything on a Mac. So if you don't have a Mac, this is not helpful to you. But um, I use a program called Pages to build the chat book. And then uh, from there, I take it and put it into a program called Create Booklet that is fairly inexpensive. I've just been using it for so long. It's probably horribly outdated too. But I use Create Booklet to actually make the, the actual book. Um, and then if you have, I think there is a version of Create Booklet on PC but I'm not 100% on that, but everyone I know with a PC is basically using InDesign. Um, I do know some people who've been somehow or another able to create their chapbooks in Canva, which I don't really understand how you do that, <laughs> but I've seen people do it. Um, but um, InDesign is allegedly really simple to use once you figure it out. Um, but that's what a lot of people um, with a PC have been using. So hopefully that helped. Let's see here. That was such a nice comment. I'm just going to read it. This is from Diada. I think Diada is how you say your name. Um, it says, hi, Matt. I binged your channel for the past few days. And can, and can I just say you are a rare, incredible human being pure love for art and encouragement to other artists all in a funny witty warm and cool personality thank you for this and again thank you so much for that that was like that just filled my heart dude filled my heart okay here's a question this is from saint keaton okay how do i join the fucking anarchy crew <laughs> okay so for those of you who don't know you join by going to my YouTube page, um, just youtube.com at slash at Matt Wall. Um, and there's a button that says join next to the subscribe button. Subscribe first and then join. And then you can pick your tier, whether it's the Thank You Crew, the Anarchy Crew, or the Chapbook of the Month Club. And um, that's funny. Um, uh, that's funny. Here's a question from Evan. How to allow yourself to be your own fan and not trash your work the moment you make it or how to be proud enough to share your work since that's really the purpose to create. Teal Deer, how to get over fear, doubt, and imposter syndrome. So um, th there's a lot here and um, I have a lot of videos talking about this stuff because... This is usually the thing that I get asked more than anything else. First off, let me, let me hit this one at a time here. How to allow yourself to be a fan of your own work and not trash it. This goes back to that video I just did the other day. Like, you become a fan of your work the second you're creating it because you get excited to create that thing. You get, you get an idea in your head and you're like, oh, I want to do that. And then you do that thing. Okay. That right there, that excitement level, that should be the same like excitement you get when you hear that your favorite author is coming out with a new book. <gasps> oh my gosh. Like it should have that same kind of feel. Then I would say, don't read it again for a couple days and then look at it. And when you look at it that next time, chances are you're going to be a little impressed that that came out of you. And when you're reading it that next time, don't read it as, oh, I'm going to read something I just wrote. Just read it as something you would normally read and see how it hits you. And chances are you're going to be fucking impressed with yourself because guess what? You're pretty fucking awesome. And chances are you're going to be writing about stuff that you are interested in. So you're going to read that and go, oh, fuck, I would buy that. I'd fucking read that. And yeah, there you go. You're a fan of yourself right there. And you just got to keep that going, you know? And even if you do the whole fake it till you make it thing, then just fake it till you make it, you know? Fake it until you really think that you're the shit. 
Like, if you are having a hard time with that, just keep telling yourself, like, you're awesome, you know? And just keep doing that, and hopefully, after doing that, I mean, they say it takes 30 days to create a habit. So maybe every day for 30 days, wake up in the morning, go look in the mirror, and tell yourself that you're the best fucking writer on the goddamn fucking planet, and nobody could tell you different, okay? And just say that every day for the next month, and see how you feel next month. Okay. Now, being proud enough to share your work, you don't have to be proud enough to share it. You just have to share it. And then either people will like it, love it, not really care for it, or hate it. But whenever that happens, that has nothing to do with you. You have no control over how people view your work. But after you create something, it is dead to you, and it becomes the reader's. It is not yours anymore. You have no say in how it affects other people. It is its own living, breathing thing and will have its own life in other people's lives. Okay? So being proud, I don't think, has anything to do with it. Um, I think people who focus on pride when they write stuff typically don't write very much or if they do they don't publish very much because they're constantly worried that people are going to think that what they're writing is subpar so they think if they don't write or if they don't publish very much that the stuff they publish will definitely be the cream of the crop which isn't necessarily true because art is subjective so some things people will like and other things people won't there's times when i thought oh, this is my best poem. Someone's going to love this. And then they don't. And then they tell me what their favorite poem of mine is. And I'm like, that's your favorite poem? Really? Okay, well, shit. If that hit you, great. I just just didn't, didn't expect that to happen. So we don't ever know. So pride in our own work doesn't mean anything. Like, you should be proud that you're doing the work. And when you write something and you read it, you should feel proud of it. But once you're posting it, that has you have nothing to do with that anymore. And how do you get over fear, doubt, and imposter syndrome? I think the more times you do something, the easier it's going to be. So usually that first book that people put out, they're terrified. They are so fucking scared. And they put it out and they look at their, whether it's their KDP dashboard or their fucking um, Etsy sales or their clicks on Instagram and they're constantly staring at that shit like worrying like oh my god are people liking this what, what's happening this, should I not be doing this am, am I a loser like Jesus fucking Christ should I just be working at Taco Bell the more and more stuff you put out the less that happens like I've put books out and like don't even look at their sales anymore like I might do it like once a month when I'm putting up my other book but like I'm not looking at any sales stats and I probably should just to like try to keep up on trends and what's good but like there were days like way back when when I obsessed over that shit because I was afraid I didn't want to have imposter syndrome I and all that other shit but the more you do something the easier it is and this is the same thing because like I had one child and I felt like I could not have another kid Because I felt like I loved my kids so much and there was so much love in my heart that I felt like, and my kid was taking all that. And I felt like if I had another kid, my heart would just explode and I wouldn't be able to do it because like I care so much about my child. And I met this one woman one time who had like eight kids and I'm like, Jesus Christ, how the fuck do you do that? Like, I can't even fucking fathom having another kid. Like, I just feel like my heart would break. And she's like, no, 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 no. You just keep having them. And the more you have, the less you care. And like pretty soon by the time the last one comes, you're just like, oh, okay. Like go out and play in the street. I don't give a shit. (laughs) Now, obviously she's joking, but there is some truth in what she's saying there. You know what I'm saying? So just do, just publish and just keep doing it. And it will get easier and easier and you will feel better and better. And then beyond that, The other thing that really helps as you're doing that is that you'll see your audience grow. And when you have social proof that you're not an imposter, it makes things really easy to keep going. Okay. So Evan, thank you so much for your question. And I hope that was helpful. 
Chasey left a question um, on the Anne Sexton documentary watch along, asked if I could do something similar with Sylvia Plath. And um, and if I like Plath's poetry. And I do like some of Plath's poetry. And yeah, I'm planning on doing something um, with Sylvia Plath um, in this same vein. If I'm honest, I forgot I was doing that series. So um, I fucked up. I got to go back and start doing that. This is from Deborah. Just a request for us old people who have bad eyesight. Could you increase the font size? <laughs> And um, I think I went over this already, but yeah, I, I already did. I can't remember which book I changed it on. It might have been me as an action figure. Um, I upped the font size uh, quite a bit. So everything since then, um, the font size has been bigger. And I didn't even realize this until I was uh, looking at poems about fucking, because I'm putting the ebook for that together. And I saw how small that print was. And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, what the fuck was I thinking? So I apologize to everyone for the micro print. You guys thought I was going to say something else. Jeff asks, will Drinking on the Beach be the next book? That's funny and probably not. Although um, I almost went and did that today. Sure. And someone answered one of my questions. I asked in a paperback book. Um, those things that I'm like, they're not end pages. I don't know what the hell they're called, but it's like a different color page that's in between the cover and the rest of the book. I didn't, couldn't remember what that was called. And um, Rob Warren told me that um, the red page is called a fly leaf. And then I immediately remembered that. So thank you for that. Okay, so this question is from Jim. And he actually, I should actually read the read the email he sent me. Okay, um, can you tell me if you can list your books without using their Kindle Publishing Direct exclusive program when you upload your typeset book on their site? And he's talking about Amazon, and the answer is yes. You do not have to enroll in KDP. And when you are um, doing the, when you're uploading your book, there's going to be three different pages. One page is going to have the the book stuff, like the um, title, subtitle, author, keywords, categories, all that shit. The next page is going to be the um, uploading your manuscript, manuscript, uploading the cover. And then the next page, I think, is where you set the prices for all the different territories. And that's where you can also put digital rights management on your book and i think that's the page where you enroll your book into kdp now if you do not want your book enrolled in kdp do not check that box um, if you do want it enrolled in kdp basically what this does is for the next 90 days that book is exclusive to amazon and cannot be sold anywhere else and if it's up on a website somewhere or a chapter of it is up on your blog and the algorithm and the robots and whatever find out they will take your book down and you will be penalized like not being able to put stuff up on amazon for a certain amount of time but the other thing you get with this is you get to do um, countdown deals you get to do and what a countdown deal is is like say you're selling your book for 2.99 you could have it up there for 99 cents and it'll have a countdown clock like saying it'll be 99 cents until this time um, to like entice people to buy you can do um, free giveaways for a certain amount of time um, it's, it's kind of a cool thing, but again, you are exclusive to Amazon for that 90-day period. After that 90-day period, your book will enroll again unless you unclick it. So what I always tell people to do is if you're going to put your book in KDP, click it, publish the book, and then as soon as the book is published, go back in and edit the details and unclick it right then. So that way you don't forget and then your book's fucking stuck in for another three fucking months because that happens a lot. Hopefully that helped. Okay, this was a question from Brian and he says, I'm curious about where you draw the line between craftsmen and artists. 
to me, creative writers are artists who developed craft through practice, and then that craft serves their art. Nonfiction writers are craftsmen who learn to infuse their craft with art so that it transcends the facts. And that's a fine way to describe it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. This is kind of how I look at this. An artist, to me, is somebody who creates out of compulsion and can't really help themselves. They are drawn to it. It's an obsession. They have to create. That is what they are. They are an artist. They are creating art. They are creators, okay? A craftsman would be somebody who creates because they learned how to do something. And so now they have this craft, and now they are going to use that craft to earn them money somehow, or earn them whatever the fuck they get for the things they make, okay? They they do the thing, they follow the steps, they get it done. And then there is some sort of exchange for that, okay? Now, um, an artist can also be a craftsman. A craftsman could also be an artist, okay? It's just that there are people who bitch about this kind of thing. And when those people who are bitching about it those people are usually, like, 99% of the time, craftsmen bitching about what it means to be an artist. They're the ones who are really pissed off about it. They're the ones screaming from the rooftops. They're the ones saying, well, that's not real because what I do, blah, 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 and all that shit. And it's that whole thing again, like... Um, thou protest too much or something like that it's projection and it's fucking stupid so either so fucking annoying and what do we call that folks what do we call that small dick energy right there yeah so when there is somebody out there who fucking complain so much and wants the other wants the other to not exist anymore because of this that or the other that's projection they're doing that out of insecurity they're doing that because they don't want anyone to say they're any less but usually the other doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the one over here if that makes any sense. That's why it's so mind-blowing to them that anyone without any training would possibly conceive to do what they've been trained to do. It's like a right brain versus left brain here. Like, I don't know if that's helpful, but um, that is what I think about it. And um, I'm not talking shit on either one of those things. If you want to be a craftsman, awesome. If you want to be an artist, awesome. You can be both. I don't give a shit. This is a question from uh, Tanabaugh Design Boutique. Uh, this says, uh, do you think it will ever be possible for someone to get Bukowski level money for doing live readings? It boggles my mind that he was that famous and that rich in the 80s. I guess his swag was undeniable, but it's still crazy that he actually did get the rewards of fame, women, and money while he was still alive. And what does he say here? And I know you've obviously made money from performing music, but do people actually ever get paid to read poetry live these days? I think the thing that makes everything really difficult in figuring this kind of shit out is the rise of inflation as opposed to the rise of the cost of living. I think if those numbers, because you could look back, and I'm trying to remember exactly when the cross happened to where um, the cost of living started skyrocketing over the... Um, rate of inflation 
but I'm pretty sure it was the early 80s. So we're talking um, like Reagan era policies. And when you look at that, like Bukowski got in and got out right as the cost of living was um, growing at such a huge fucking rate that um, people just couldn't keep up with anything anymore. So I think that if you took all the shit Bukowski did in the 70s and you transplanted that to the 90s, I think his money would look a lot different. If you took that and did it today, it would be drastically fucking different. Because like we're looking at that money with today's eyes. So we see that like oh, he got like uh, like 100 bucks to do a reading at this one place. Well, yeah, but now that would that 100 bucks would be like $800 or something like that. And we're like, "What the fuck?" Um, but when we say, oh yeah, he got a hundred bucks, you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like, that makes sense. Like, but again, I don't know if that's me with my eyes being as old as they are that I remember what it was like getting paid a hundred bucks to go do a one night thing somewhere. Do, Do you understand what I'm saying? So do I think it's possible? Well, actually, let me answer the question like this. Do I think people get paid like that for readings now? Yes and no. I think there are a upper echelon of motherfuckers who are legit enough in places that are funded by grants and by things of that nature that they get that kind of money and probably a lot more. But the thing with that is, is that that money is not based on people wanting them to be there. That money is based on grants and by endowments. Um, to give to people, to spread the love of art to motherfuckers. But I think if, like, Ocean Vong had to fucking sell out a fucking club, that that might be kind of hard. I'm sure he could do it in some places, but, like, putting asses in seats based off of ticket sales, I don't know if the poetry establishment that exists right now can pull that off. I'm hoping to change that. But um, I feel like I've been looking at trying to change it from the wrong avenues. And so I'm kind of like rethinking the live performance strategy in my head right now to try to make that a bigger fucking deal. The other part of that question, do I think it's possible for people to get Bukowski level money for doing live readings? I think it will be, and I think it will be really soon. But... A lot of this has to do with our mindsets, and we have to change that mindset. So if it's something like where, like for instance, Henry Rollins, like I don't know how much Henry Rollins gets for doing spoken word performances, but that's basically him doing readings. Like if you've ever read his books and then heard his spoken word stuff, it's very similar, okay? And I know he tours the world doing that. So he's making money. And that motherfucker is putting asses in seats. I know he does do colleges every once in a while and stuff like that. But he does that thing. And you got to remember, like Rod McEwen back in the 70s. I can't remember what fucking venue it was. But for a few years in a row, like every year on his birthday... He sold out, like, oh, what venue was it? Was it Madison Square Garden or some fucking ridiculous fucking thing like that? It wasn't Madison Square Garden. I can't remember what it was. But look it up. Like, he would sell out arenas to hear him fucking read his poetry. Okay? So, it is something that's possible. And I fucking was talking to Bucks the other day, too. Like, this is all the same conversation. That's why that conversation was so fucking good. He said something like T.S. Eliot was um, selling out stadiums for people to hear him read, which I can't fucking believe at all that anyone would want to go fucking listen to that motherfucker kill poetry for a couple hours. Well, I just pissed off so many people. (laughs) Classic, classic shit here, guys. So, um, So, yeah, that's my answer. Thanks for that question, dude. And then I have a question from St. Keaton again. 
I want to make a chat book. How the hell do you make these? Um, and the best answer for that is I have a bunch of videos on my page um, on how to do that. So hopefully that's helpful. And let me know how you're doing with that too, by the way. And here comes the goddamn fucking ice cream truck. Fucking piece of shit murder fucking van. I'm going to read this comment because this is awesome. This is on one of the podcast episodes. This is from uh, JJ Stewart said, I love you're so passionate. When I hear you talk, I imagine some half Viking berserker sitting in a tavern over a pint of ale, bitching about how they're fucking up the invasion and how you want to leave and go back to Norway and work in your forge. <laughs> and then it says, that's a compliment, by the way. <laughs> that's so fucking good. Thank you for that. Paul says... Hey, Matt, do you think we all have one exceptionally good work in us? And if so, do you think you've written yours yet? Um, I think we all have, like, many, many great works in us. And I've probably already written mine, and I'm probably already going to, or I'm going to write a ton more. Because the exceptionally good work... I don't know if we know that that's our exceptionally good work until people tell us that that's our exceptionally good work, you know? So I think that's all relative and very subjective. So, um, but yeah, I think everyone has something, you know, and most people I think have more than one. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll all hit that. Oh, and then there was this question um, from Julie saying when she goes on Amazon to look for my stuff, she types in Matt Wall and she usually gets Matt Paint, like for the wall and stuff like that. So if you're looking for me, you either need to use my link um, that's in the comments or in the description of these episodes and stuff like that in my videos and know that that is an affiliate link. So I will get a kickback. Um when you use that to look at my shit or when you are looking on Amazon, just put like Matt wall books or Matt wall poetry or something like that. And it, my stuff should come up. There's another question from Paul here. Do you write the same book from the perspective of all the characters, each one in first person narrative, then mix and match between them for the final draft? When I'm doing um, novels with multiple characters, um, I usually don't write the same story for each character. Um, I will usually do it in chapters. So this chapter will be this person. This chapter will be that person. This chapter will be that person. And it's usually from their perspective, but it will be a different part of that story. When they're at Bob's Burgers, it'll be from the point of view of Sammy. And then when they're at the drive-in, it'll be from the point of view of Lucy or something like that. But that's kind of how I do that. Okay, now this question, I remember I started talking about during a, um, a vlog. But I'm going to actually read the question now and answer it. And this again is from Tanabaugh Designs Boutique. Do you think a mainstream poetry boom is on the horizon? Kind of like how punk rock had a revival in the early 90s. It was basically something very niche that became widely marketable and lucrative if you were in the right place at the right time doing the right sound. Also, I think you should try to do for live poetry what Kill Tony did for comedy. Get a brick and mortar location, charge admission, and then set yourself up as the gatekeeper for the next generation of up and coming cool poets literally physically set yourself apart from all the corny insta poetry and flaccid academic academic dinosaurs people are super okay with being mediocre behind a keyboard on the internet but getting up on a mic in front of people is a great motivation to not be totally whack anyway i enjoy your videos and your personality thanks okay and this is kind of a conversation that i've been having a lot lately do i think a mainstream poetry boom is on the horizon yes but it's already here in some parts 
I can't remember who I heard saying this recently. It was probably fucking Matthew Buckley Smith, let's be real. Both of these things are true at the same time. Poetry is more popular than ever, and poetry is probably more niche than ever. Okay? It actually might have been Andrew Whitstead who said that. Poetry is... Certain poetry is doing really, really well. Other poetry is not. And the reason, and when I say things like formal poetry is dead or academic poetry is dead, like obviously people are still doing that. But when I say that's dead, I'm not talking about the actual poets who are writing the shit. I'm talking about the way that that poetry is getting out to the masses. The academic publishing world, I think, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it will eventually either eat itself alive or it will be such a small bubble that most people aren't really going to know a whole lot about it in the next 20 years. Now, things can change and they could change their fate, but there are things that need to be done that I don't think they are capable of doing. So unless there is someone like me in the formal poetry world or in the academic poetry world who is like pushing for things to change, I don't think there ever will be any change over there. As far as like insta poetry, which you like called out as corny insta poetry, um, that is probably not as popular as it was like a couple years ago but has the potential to continue to be popular if the people who were popular continue to create stuff i heard one of the big kind of insta poets kind of got really dark for a little bit there that rh sin character um got kind of dark and so i don't know what's going on there but um, that might be where it's going. Um, hopefully, like, fucking fingers crossed, we get some angsty fucking insta poetry. That'd be amazing. But I think there are some very cool fucking poetry pockets that could explode if they were marketed the right way. I just feel like nobody really knows how to do that yet. And so having big publishing booms... Um, until we figure out how to make that work, I don't know if it's going to work. Because right now, the biggest poetry booms you have is when celebrities put out poetry books. And um, that's great. Like, I know a lot of people hate that, but I think it's great for people to just be able to normalize, like, liking poetry. And if that's what it takes, fucking great. I hope someone who reads the Lana Del Rey poetry book about poetry in Los Angeles will want to pick up my Los Angeles chapbook and read my poetry. You know what I'm saying? So whenever poetry becomes popular at all, I look at that as a as an end for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, try to figure out how to ride that fucking wave. And then I feel like once publishing understands what to do because like publishing has been in flux since the um like early 2010s not knowing what to do and chasing its own tail trying to fucking figure out what ends up um and hopefully by the end of this decade they will be able to figure out how to exist or they will just go fucking die so we could get on with our fucking lives instead of keeping fucking traditional publishing on fucking life support that would be fucking amazing either figure your shit out or die for fuck's sake please and then i think you can have a mainstream poetry boom but at the same time as you might have heard on other episodes or other videos of mine i don't think the mainstream can exist the way it existed over the last 50 years because i feel like there are too many avenues for people to consume content. Back when you had radio stations, TV stations, and you only had like maybe two radio stations in your town and three TV stations in your town. And then you had some magazines that would cover the stuff that was in 
those TV stations and those radio stations. That was a lot easier to become mainstream than now when you have thousands of channels, thousands of like Spotify playlists, thousands of like people on social media on tens of different platforms. It just makes it really a lot harder. Is there a way to do it? I hope so. I'm working on it. We'll see if we can make it happen. And then the idea about doing a brick and mortar location, like I'm trying, like I've been wanting to do it. Um, I've been trying to figure out ways to make it happen. Um, fingers fucking crossed. I hope I can pull it together. If you guys all want to fucking go in and make some big ass fucking awesome fucking brick and mortar place that we could like rule the world from, let me fucking know. I am open to all fucking suggestions. And with that said, I think it's time to get into the butt plugs. So welcome to butt plug territory, guys. Join the Anarchy crew. Um, we already talked about that. Pick up my chapbooks, Poems Over Kitty, up on my Etsy shop, Pharma Phoenix Rises over on Amazon, um, as well as many other books, including the Poetic Anarchy Anthologies, um, Pick Up Bloodshed Review, Issue 3, Issue 4 comes out in November, and um, Blood Rag, Issue 15, this is last month's edition, so hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, um, Blood Rag 16, the October edition, will be out. And hopefully my new chapbook, Abnormal Brain, will also be out. Um, I just want to thank all you guys for sending in questions. You guys are fucking awesome. And again, this was long, so type hard, everybody. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.